Hello and welcome to The Inquisitive Friend. I'm Shaw, your host. This is a podcast that brings interviews and insights from all walks of life on the reality of being. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Inquisitive Room podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you're new here, we hope that you stick around. And if you are returning, thank you so much. We appreciate it. I do hope that you're all doing well. As always, please subscribe to the channel, click that like button and turn on your notifications so you never miss an episode. And if you like the interview, if you like the podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Today, I am joined by Betty Kovacs, who earned her PhD from the University of California in Irvine in comparative literature and theory of symbolic mythic language. She taught literature writing and she served many years as chair and program chair on the board of directors of the Young Society. Betty is on the Academic Advisory Board of Forever Family Foundation and if you've listened to any of my interviews, you'll know that I interviewed Bob Ginsberg, who was in the program on Netflix, um, Surviving Death. And Betty's very involved with that particular foundation, which is wonderful. It helps to look into uh, after-death experiences. Betty has lived experience of afterlife, after the tragic passing of her son and then of her husband. She has experienced her son's consciousness after his death for an extended period of time. She has two books. The first is The Miracle of Death, There's Nothing But Life, and the merchants of light the consciousness that is changing the world that book won a nautilus silver book award and the scientific and medical network 2019 book prize she's also working quite closely with the medical community and she's here today to tell us about her work which is expanding you know i always talk about we need more research we need more research and that in itself is expanding she's going to talk about as well how people are very much into near-death experiences Um, but i also point out that we do need more research into after death or after life experiences as well so i'm very pleased to have her on the show today without further ado let's welcome betty to the show Betty, it's lovely to see you. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so happy to be with you. Now, I would like to focus on your two books. Um, We're going to start with The Miracle of Death. There is nothing but life. I love that title. Um, (laughs) Tell us, please, what inspired you to write this book? You know, after I had gone through, after my husband and I had gone through the death of our son at 20 years old, um, we had so many experiences with his consciousness after his death. And I felt, and then my husband also was killed in a car accident two years later, I felt that if my experiences, which really helped to heal me and my husband, Ishtvan, if I wrote a book that if I, I would say to myself at the time, if I could help one person, you know, get through the kind of grief that we have when someone we love passes, then it will be worth it. And so, and I also felt that these experiences were were so profound that came to us that they really needed to be recorded. In fact, we did when we, both my husband and I had these experiences. And when we had them, we recorded them so that we would not forget anything. It was just so amazing. I mean, what we're involved in, we just felt it was so amazing that we had to record it. And then when he passed too, I knew that I just had to take those recordings and make a book because again and again, we knew there is no death, you know, and that helps us to survive. And I think it's also our heritage to be in touch with those we love on the other side then we can heal. But this has been severed in Western culture, and we've done everything in Western culture to sever it in every other culture. And 
we need to reconnect that because that that we uh, we must have for our own survival is contact with the other side, co-create with that side. So that's why <laughs> I wrote it. Wonderful. Um, because you do, now you touch upon dreams in that book as well, which I'm going to come to. But it's very interesting because the experiences outlined in the book are fascinating. They are probably experiences that other people have, but they're not open to them. Maybe they don't acknowledge them or they don't uh, recognize that that's happened. Oh, yeah. Which brings me... I'm Yes, which brings me to the issue of dreams, because mm -hmm. you mentioned dreams and that sometimes and many times they have shaped your life. How can dreams help us as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, certainly they do. And uh, I had uh, had loved Carl Jung, the psychiatrist, uh, and Jung said, and I have discovered for myself as a teacher of myth and fairy tale and dreams, that there are organizing principles that produce these dreams and visions uh, and fairy tales. That if they're not these stories that we experience are not random stories or created by the left brain, by the conceptual brain. There is an organizing principle within the human psyche that constructs these stories. And so Jung, real, I mean, he worked with thousands and thousands of patients, and he saw that there was an, or, an organizing principle in their dreams specifically related to that person's development. Sometimes it's a complementary dream, or sometimes it's telling us something of the future, but they're always guides uh, to our development, just as the fairy tales are and the myths and, and visions. If there's something really negative about the human being, that we uh, receive as a story, this is not out of the human psyche. The psyche is totally in support of our development. <laughs> and, uh, and I say this because many of the myths that were organized by these inner principles were inverted by those in power who wanted us to believe we were nothing. So uh, these dreams will will be organized by these principles for our growth and development. But I think that many people, because of our culture, we've been told that's nonsense. There's nothing to which you ate too much, you know, that kind of thing. But if we pay attention, Kim and I uh, have a radio show through Bob Ginsburg's Forever Family with Janet Mayer, and she is uh, a medium, but she's, uh, she's just very perceptive. And she's always saying, pay attention. You know, give attention to these things because sometimes I'll wake up and I'll we'll have had a dream and I feel like it's nothing. You know, it's first, and then I think, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> and I I would make myself write them down. Sometimes we have what just seems like nonsense. It's like a lot of different fragments and we don't know what's going on. And if we pay attention even to that, but if it doesn't make sense, just wait and maybe it will, maybe it won't. But maybe the psyche is just you know, sort of doodling <laughs> and thinking. <laughs> but I think that when you when we receive those dreams that are the big dreams, we know, oh, pay attention to this. This is a real guide for our development. Yes. For our healing. For our healing, yes. And it was yeah. fascinating to read about your dreams um, of your son, about how different there was a lot of imagery and synergy and symbolism in some of what you described as well so yes very, very interesting and i know that readers viewers the links to both books will be in the show notes but i think it will help a lot of people to read this book if you're questioning which we're going to come on to because I love what you talk about I'm, I'm going ahead I'm jumping ahead here but um, you talk a bit about experience versus belief so we're going to come to that that's in the second book the other book but I think this will really help people who aren't sure about dreams dreams can appear to be woo woo as they call them they think oh well that was nothing yeah as you said but actually if you maybe get a bit of help. I don't know, the dream books can help, I believe. Some of them can help. 
I, my main goal, if I'm doing mediumship, is to prove that there's life after the physical death. Mm -hmm. And I'm what you would call an evidential medium, so I've got to give I've got to give evidence. That's yes. my job. <laughs> it's not about me. It's about what comes through. And so sometimes dreams will come up as well. Um, the spirit might say, oh, you know, tell her that she had that dream the other night. And, you know, how would I know that? How would I know? Exactly, exactly. Those very specifics. So your other book, which I want to come on to, Merchants of Light, the consciousness that change or that is changing the world. What do you mean by consciousness? <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, for so long, uh, the beginning of science in the 1660s of official science was censored by the church. There could be no investigation of anything but matter. So, of course, they would come up with uh, the notion that there's nothing but matter because that's all they could investigate. There had been scientists and mystics before. Those science and mystics studied consciousness. And it's just really hard to give a definition for that. That is simply our knowingness. And now quantum physicists who have taken a little step into the, the mystical to experience consciousness, they say consciousness is primary. It comes before matter. Consciousness creates matter. When matter is gone, consciousness continues. And I think that there has been so much investigation into this and evidence of this from near death, or as they say in the UK, actual death experiences, and from so many other types of experience. Even the anecdotal experience, as one writer says, you can't dismiss that when in every age, every ethnic group all around the world, people are having the same experiences it's time to pay attention. <laughs> so I think there's not a question anymore in those, by those who have actually done the research and know this, and especially if they've experienced it themselves. But I think just intellectually, we have to just say, the evidence is in, consciousness is, and it continues to be. So this is a, this is a great healing thing. Now the question is, how do we experience the ones we love on the other side. And dreams is one. And there are many uh, techniques, I think, that from our ancestors and also from uh, modern people who are developing techniques that will help us to just switch that consciousness to the other side. You know, Henry Bergson said that, you know, we are all born, we are all in universal mind, but we have that valve that Re that restricts the flow of that consciousness so that we can do such interviews or cook our dinner or whatever. Every civilization needs to focus on how do we release that valve to experience the wholeness of who we are, which is universal mind, universal consciousness. And so uh, I think that in our time now that we are coming back to uh, studying our consciousness and knowing there's another side, that we are developing techniques and we will continue to develop techniques of how to open to that universal mind. When we experience that, we're changed forever. <laughs> yes. I like what you were just saying too about uh, there are techniques. So mm -hmm. is there any one technique that you might give to our listeners that may help them to learn to expand uh, mm -hmm. their consciousness? Well, one, I am happy to say, a scientific group that studies these things, heart math, because they have uh, discovered what our ancestors knew thoroughly, and that is that the heart is the fifth brain component. It is, It gives more information to the brain than the brain gives to the heart. And we now know, too, that the love, the compassion, the feeling that comes from the heart is the highest frequency there is. And it can only connect with its own kind. And so it throws out, I love how it's described, a high frequency bridge between the heart and the other brain components. And then the only response we can get is a loving response. And then what happens is that 
it changes, this actually changes matter into what we call imaginal cells. <laughs> These are different cells than are produced at the lower frequencies of anger or whatever. Uh, not that we should never feel anger, that's a true feeling, but, but at any rate, this is a, an incredible thing that we're learning. And so heart math has techniques and one very, very simple one, and most of these are simple, <laughs> but is that you just simply focus on your heart. And even if you have to hold your hand on your heart to remind you, it's the heart that is, is, has this connection to universal mind. It is, the Sufis knew that it's the organ of soul. The heart is the organ of soul. So to focus on that and allow oneself to breathe in and out. And it's so strange because you begin to have a diff different frequency and they say, ask a question. It may not answer it during the time you're doing this breathing and focusing on connecting to the heart of the universe because it is the same. We're all at the center, the heart of the universe. Every single person is at the heart. And so if they say, you will get an answer. It might not be then, but you will. Uh, the answer will come. But what this does is that it helps us to remember that heart consciousness, feeling, love, compassion, that's what is creative in connecting us to the universal mind. Now, our ancestors, especially in, well, in many places all over, the indigenous people all over the world had their techniques. Many of them, for instance, in Africa, the San Bushmen had the technique of dancing and chanting. Many have that. We don't know quite how to do that, although Native Americans also do that. And uh, it's that repetitiveness that creates a slow brain wave, which connects the brain components. That's one, and we can learn from our ancestors, some of these. Uh, also, many ancestors, uh, well, I want to maybe just stick with the sand for a moment. They are beautiful people, so profoundly feeling and competent in, in the realm of consciousness and love. And we've just, the Western world dismissed them because we didn't know anything and they weren't about to tell us because they knew we would dismiss them, you know? So they've kept many of their abilities secret, but there have been recently those who've worked with them in a loving way and they've revealed their secrets to them. But they are able through their dancing to go into altered states of consciousness and they can also ignite that consciousness in others. And of course they dance and they dance together it's not like sitting in an ashram and uh, meditating alone. When they heard of that, they felt that's so sad <laughs> to be alone. No, we do it together. And then they can take that energy, and this is just phenomenal, and form it into a little arrow or needle and throw it at someone. And that can ignite it in them. I mean, they're a phenomenal group of people. And they now through uh, Keeney, what is his first name? Hmm? Oh, Bradford Keeney, yes. Uh, he and his wife, Hillary, worked with them for years. They trusted him enough that they've released their teachings through him. And uh, But at any rate, uh, he was the one who told them that in India, they meditate alone. But for them, it's love and it's connection and bringing the community into this higher consciousness. Other groups have used sacred plants. This was all over uh, the world. And these secret plants, again, have been so misunderstood in the West. Oh, no, we don't do this. We do it ourselves, which is, you know, we don't do anything really alone <laughs> when we think about it. I mean, if I couldn't write anything if there hadn't been people before me informing me, <laughs> you know. And the other side, we learn from the other side constantly because we are a part of the quantum field and all that's been is flowing through us. So, but at any rate, they have used sacred medicine, many different types of plants. This is a tremendous gift on the planet, all of these plants, but we need to know how to use them. And I went twice to Peru and worked with shamans and they used San Pedro. Uh, and I had some pretty powerful experiences, and I was still very much a left brain person when I went. Uh, but later, my husband and I also, we, we worked with music, the chanting, the drumming, and we also worked with sacred plants. And I have to say that our ancestors were quite right. I mean, that opens the, the heart 
and mind to universal mind. And when you when we realize who we are, we're changed. And we also know we had long conversations with our son. And that helps us realize it was like, yes, we never have anyone forever. And it's so important to realize that, that they're, we're here and we're there, but that it's so important to work together. And the message from him is, I could be more effective here. And uh, Ishvan had my husband the same when he passed over. And I think that that's true. It is our destiny, our heritage, to work with those on the other side. Many of our uh, ancestors had rituals that helped us to connect even the, the nature here, the land, uh, energies in the land with those on the other side so that the energy could flow. So we've, we're waking up after all of these years of repression and suppression of who we are. And the trouble with the Western mind is that it was so left brain and there were those in power suppressed our ability <laughs> to be in touch. And we tried to do that with every country we came into and we looked down on them. In Africa, there's so many indigenous cultures that knew how to connect. And what did we do? We make fun of anyone anywhere, but we're changing with quantum physics. We're beginning to grow up. <laughs> you know? And I think now that's going to be, it's, I think our generations today are going to make a difference. Wow. As you spoke about the heart connection, I could just feel something there and I couldn't mm. help put my hand on my heart. <laughs> So yes. the energy is just so high. It raises it. energy and changes that in a particular way, just speaking about it. It does. And this is, I hadn't understood it as well as I do now, earlier when I wrote, but that the frequency of love is the highest frequency there is. And we cannot do anything violent if we have that frequency. And you know, in the, uh, Hebrew first temple tradition, Margaret Barker has made it clear that that was a shaman mystic tradition and it was destroyed by the Deuteronomist. And they they knew so much about that, that uh, mystic state because wisdom or the goddess or the fiery tree of life, she would, and wisdom it's called, or the queen of heaven, she said, if you hold me fast, you will not sin. So they knew that love, that's what she was, that if they love, they can, you can't sin. I didn't understand that for a very long time. I thought, that's quite a promise. <laughs> but with the frequency of love, you can't, you know? And Maybe. they knew that as well as the Egyptians. Yes. So do you believe, do you think we're in the age of consciousness now? I mean, I know we're in the age of information. This is all... It's growing. I believe there's another shift coming with that as well. But are, are we now approaching an age of consciousness? You know, I think that uh, in, in the Merchants of Light, I say that, you know, there were cultures in the past who were shaman mystic cultures, and in many cases also scientists. And they were suppressed and repressed in, in Western culture so that only the left brain could develop. And I say there have been five Renaissance periods of that underground tradition emerging into mainline culture and trying to bring about a change. They all failed. We're in the fifth one today. And I, I think we cannot fail today. And I don't think we will. But yes, I think that, yes, there's all this information and talk of having artificial intelligence and, instead of the left brain, making a big left brain. <laughs> and and actually negating the human species altogether eventually. I think that that's by people who are left brain people. They don't know who we really are because that's been suppressed. And yes, I think that this is the fifth, and our science and quantum physicists are saying that consciousness is primary. It creates matter. This is huge. It's a com completely negates the old world view that there's nothing but matter and there's no meaning or purpose and when we're dead, we're dead. That we now know is false through quantum physics. Not everybody's paying attention to that. <laughs> and there's <laughs> still those who want to merge us with machine and do away with us all together to have some big artificial brain, which they won't even be experiencing because they won't exist either. <laughs> so it's a, we now know that 
left brain, when the left brain is severed from the right brain and heart consciousness, it has the same characteristics as the schizophrenic. And when we look around the world and see what's happening, we think, well, uh, oh, oh, you know, we can't even understand. Of course not. And they can't either. It is, it is a serious schizophrenic condition, which I hope that all of us in consciousness studies or those who are, try, are experiencing the other side and trying to integrate it, that we can help to heal that terrible schizophrenic consciousness in our culture. So yes, I think this is, even indigenous people say, we used to say, don't, don't write about this because you'll be you know, destroyed. And they say, now is the time to release everything. Because uh, with quantum physics, we can, we can say, well, wait a minute, our myth has been physics physics, I mean, matter, that's it. And now, hello, <laughs> quantum physicists who are also having experiences. Some of them have gone to mm. Peru and worked with ayahuasca. That they, they understand, or, or Fitchoff Capra, for example, that was early on, I think in the 80s, a singular person in a way. He uh, was on the beach and I, I it was probably, um, not I certainly not I, LSD probably at that time. Yeah, yeah. He had the experience of everything he'd studied as a physicist. He saw the world coming into being and how it plays and disappears and comes back. I mean, people have been absolutely transformed through these sacred medicines, and many of our there have been I don't know whether I could say many several very important people in mathematics and physics who have had those experiences and now their their work in mathematics and physics physics means so much more now they understand it from an inner uh, perspective uh, and i think there are tremendous possibilities for us today we we just need to know that <laughs> so we don't get discouraged never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now thank you for your support you make this podcast possible now back to the show that's so um, hopeful. You yes. saying that it feels very hopeful, really. Which brings me on to experience versus belief, or when we believe. What are your thoughts about this? So for me, I I can do both. I don't have to experience something to believe it. I you know I believe things that haven't yet happened. Um, yet when I do experience something. There's automatic belief. I never question. I never <laughs> question. Right. Was that yes. was that real? Was that right? Was that so? How? What is this all about, Betty? Why? Why? Well, is... I think. <laughs> well, it's a wonderful question because I think in the Western world, uh, when uh, religion took over from the shamanic indigenous traditions, it uh, it didn't bring with it the techniques the methods of experiencing the other side uh, because ritual and various ways of, of being in the world can help us to have the actual experience. So um, we had to believe, you know, they just, they put everything, you have to believe. The problem with that is you believe what I tell you and they created the stories and inverted them. But I know people who believe, who've never had an experience, but they definitely believe and that there is something beyond. And I think the belief helps us to be open to the possibility. And, and actually, if it's a strong belief, as you were describing yours, then there's a kind of knowing. It's just something in us knows it. And I think that belief comes from a deep knowing in many cases. And it keeps us open for the experience. Uh, I remember when I was young, uh, young, Jung said uh, that there are those who can't believe. And I think I, I just, I wanted to know. I wanted so much to know for sure, you know. And so I think that that was a, a guiding uh, feature in my life that I was determined that I was going to find out. And I did all kinds of things, but it wasn't until Pishti, our son, died and we actually had experience with him from the other side that I knew. And it was interesting because he said, for instance, in one example, he said to my husband Ishvan something that had happened in my life a long time ago. I'd never mentioned it to him or Ishvan, but he knew. 
And that was, things like that were helpful, you know. Now, my husband had, he very kind and loving and supportive of my interests, but they had never been his. And then two weeks before Pishti died, he saw the accident happen. He was in his study and suddenly he saw his body superimposed on a car off the side of the freeway. And he knew that he was dead because there were two different dimensions. And he heard himself say, oh, that's right. It's almost time for you to do that, Pishti. And that shocked him. And then Pishti said, that's right, dad. I'll be out of the house for a little while. And then Ishvan became completely unconscious of it until we got the call from the hospital. And he remembered that. He didn't tell me until after Pishti's death, but he said, I tried to believe he could be, he, he could come back. But he said, I always had that vision that no, he was gone, but, and he was. But uh, Ishvan hadn't, he had not had any experiences except that. And then when, when Pishti died, it's like the whole world opened up for him. And uh, and he was couldn't believe either, but when he experienced it, he knew, and that changed everything. So it's good to believe if it can keep us open to, uh, well, it's good to believe because it, we, to believe in meaning is so much better than to believe in nothingness, you know? So, and, and that, as you say for you, in certain cases, that's what you need, that's it. But then you're open to experience too. So yes. both are important. It is all very important. But why do you think it's so difficult for people to believe? I know you mentioned that Young said some people can't believe. I, I believe that. I agree with that. What stops us? Is it ego? Is it um, the left brain needs proof? Mm. What is it? I, I, exactly. I think that since 621 BCE, when the Deuteronomist inverted our great myths into something terrible that we are, uh, and then the church, the Roman church, with all the gifts of both the Deuteronomist and the Roman church, they still inverted Jesus who, who was a great shaman mystic, into a God that we must follow rather than having our own experience. The Nag Hammadi text, which were also texts at the time of Jesus, and we found them after the war, in that Jesus makes it very clear, I did not come to save you. I came to remind you of who you are. It is not enough to follow the Christ. You must become the Christ. And this is what the church suppressed. They buried them <laughs> so they wouldn't be burned, and we found them. So I think that it has been that re suppression and repression of who we are. And there is that longing in us to have our own experience. Then there was the science who said there's nothing anyway. Who do you think you are? I mean, that's just a joke. That's nonsense. That's hallucinations. And so... <laughs> We couldn't believe it because we'd been told, and the science, think of the science for a few hundred years was telling us there's nothing but matter. When you're dead, you're dead, there's nothing. What do you mean you experience something? What did you have for stuff? So I think it's just that constant reminder that there is nothing that makes people think, okay, I've got to have evidence. <laughs> you know, They told us they had evidence. Now their evidence has been caught up short. No, their worldview is incorrect. But we know that with quantum physics. But people just thought, well, I have to know, I have to experience it so I know, because we're getting all of these messages. And I think that's why it's not possible. I think that in indigenous cultures, there is that knowingness around us, and, and belief comes easily because we see it. We see it lived in our, in our elders. We don't see that here. So there are a lot of reasons that we just can't believe. But when we experience, then you know, we know. And we, we then can be open to other things, believe other possibilities that we haven't yet experienced. Yes. And when you talk about ancestors, um, we're talking about generations back. Yes. Because as we all know, sometimes grandmother, great grandmother, they were proponents for no little, you know, this, that, the closeness. <laughs> That's right, because they've been... We've all been indoctrinated. I had such experiences after our son died in the altered states of consciousness. They were so powerful. And as soon as I was no longer in the vision, my left brain jumped on it and started taking it apart. And that can't be true. And this, you know, it, that's train. I didn't think I'd been brainwashed, but I had. 
And I thought, here is this coming in from an unconscious position, tearing up my vision, you know. And now my husband didn't have that kind of training. He immediately knew there was no question. And he then became the anchor for me. And gradually, gradually, with more and more experience, I could, I healed, I think, the left brain. And now it works with the right brain rather than attacking it. But that is what it has been trained to do, you know, to attack anything that's not nothing. <laughs> Yes. Uh, we uh, we had the Young Society here. I was program chair for a while and then chair. We had, whose name I can't remember, but he was a psychiatrist. And he talked about uh, the difference between the schizophrenic and the visionary. And there's a great, there's a great difference. And any doctor needs to know that difference. Because with, the schizophrenic often isn't able to create, co-create with it and, uh, and be in I don't want to say in control, but let's say co-create with, and the voices are different. I yeah. mean, that's, and so he made it very clear as doctors, we need to know the difference. And it's very easy to know that difference. And the voices that, for instance, you hear, they are co-creative voices, just like the dream, the fairy tale. They're working to co-create a better world and a, and a healthier healing person. So yes, it's a, absolutely. I mean, that is so important, but that's been part of the old world view. I mean, everything was a, an hallucination and they wouldn't even be open to dream or vision. We're changing. There are those who will not say what he said because they have had more experience. He hasn't. He's still Western in the sense of the old world view. And we have to be able to see the difference because we can be deeply wounded. People can, who are told that, you know. Very much so, you know, the stigma that's already there about mental health, but also, um, you know, I suppose proposing that the person is ill when they're not. So there's, it could be a misdiagnosis as well. So, Absolutely. So and there have been so many. You know, it's the same with those who had uh, after death uh, or near death experiences. And there was a wonderful conference in the UK uh, and they were talking about, and doctors are, I was so delighted when I was there to realize how many psychiatrists are actually trained. They actually are trained to, to be open to and recognize when a patient is talking about a near death or actual death experience. And so all of this was being discussed. And uh, one doctor stood up and he said, this is all nonsense. He said, I've been a cardiologist for I don't know how many years, and not one patient has said anything to me about that kind of thing. And one person who had been talking about an actual death experience when he had a heart attack and was in surgery, he stood up and he said, Dr. So-and-so, I was your patient, and you would be the last person I would have told. <laughs> so, because, because, of course, he would just have dismissed it. Right. Oh, how amazing. <laughs> so we do limit our knowledge by our prejudices, don't we? <laughs> Absolutely. John Cleese, um, the actor, he is uh, doing a lot of work on near-death experience as well. And he is on some of the panels in the UK with psychiatrists. So um, there are people, I mean, you don't have to be well known, but it does help for some people who might believe um a celebrity more than they believe someone like myself who you know just goes and gives messages but yeah so it's really expanding very much so and i think that's very hopeful uh for us as a as a race as a human race i think so too and so many podcasters are doing things like this too anthony chen c-h-e-n-e -E, in france has done dozens of interviews with ordinary people but it's interesting when you hear them talk you know you know that the, I mean these people who had never thought about anything like that before and some who had but he's just done dozens and dozens on YouTube and uh, and I think that helps a lot of people they say well I saw that that and with some I've listened to I mean one man said for example He'd had no experience of any of that before, and he realized how wrong he'd been with his wife and family. And he said, even the grass had consciousness and had love. There was a love in the grass. <laughs> you know, I, I love those. So I think podcasters and and that kind of uh, those kinds of panels with people who are celebrities, people who are not. I think it's changing us. 
It's just changing us. Absolutely. Definitely. Well, I mean, with your book, The Miracle of Death, There's Nothing But Life as well. I would say to our listeners, if you are unsure, if you feel as though you don't believe, read the book because the examples I mean, there's an old saying, you can't make this up. I like I want <laughs> to so say, true. say that for these. It's extraordinary. So uh, in your life, uh, I'm sure that at some times you've reflected upon your life and why those experiences, you know, have come into your life. Um, some people believe that we call in experiences in our life. Oh, so that can be hard to believe, especially when there's loss and deprivation. Um, but what are your thoughts on that? You know, we experienced our choices. Um, it seems to me that in our time, our age, we have to know one thing for sure, and that is that consciousness does not die, that we are immortal. Our ancestors wanted us to know we are immortal, we are all divine, and we are creative. And when talking with Pishti, our son on the other side, and just that knowingness that came in those visions is that we, we all of us create in parallel worlds and we do make choices. We could see that we had made these choices. And Ishtvan, my husband, had experiences in which he said, sometimes uh, I die first and Pishti remains in some of the parallel worlds, it's which can be the mo more effective because he said it's, we wanted in whatever humble or little way we could to, to know ourselves that there is no death and to communicate that because it's really clear that the suffering on the earth is, is the most intense because of death, the belief in the end of everything we've loved. We can't live with that. We can't live with that kind of cutting it off. And so I th we did make those choices that we felt. And I think all of us are making choices and we're all doing different things and working together in different ways, you know? And sometimes someone will look at something and say, well, you know, that person's not doing much. That person may doing, be doing the one significant thing that is necessary. And so I think we all are making choices and co-creating together uh, to to help us to remember who we are so that we can co-create with the universe. Yes. That's what Jude Curvin, who's a physicist and cosmologist, has said, we are all manifestations of this great creative act. We are all manifestations of it and co-creators with it. It's a huge role and we need to know we're immortal and so that we can uh, assume the role that we, we came here for, you know? And I think these are the roles we came here for now, and we need to, as a species, know that we are co-creators with the manifestation of life. We're part of the creation of it, we are manifestations of it, and we should be co-creating here and also with those on the other side. No separation. No separation. There's so much there, but I love, you know, I interviewed Bob Ginsburg on the show and he was on the Netflix program about, um, well, mediumship and debunking and things like that. Yes. I like how you put it about belief and experience and you, they can coincide. There's some days. Yes. You may not yes. believe. Some days you, you may be a bit down. It's harder to believe things will get better. But then the next day you might experience a bit of an easier day. I think we experience them both. Uh, I have uh, a painting from a, an artist in Mexico uh, of Don Quixote. And there's one Don Quixote knocked down and kind of dazed, another one that's really out. And in the center is Don Quixote rising up and the flames are coming from his head, is that we experience disappointment, despair, uh, depression, loss of hope. But the important thing is that, that the we, you know, will rise out of that into the frequency of hope and love because they are so creative. We can be down, that's okay, but we have to rise out of it. And we can. 
we can. We can. Thank you so much, Betty. That's been amazing, fascinating. Um, gosh, there's so much to think about. <laughs> and listeners, uh, I'm sure you've really enjoyed this. Let us know what you thought about the show today. And also uh, go and get Betty's, both her books. They're fascinating. And I think you'll come away believing. I think you'll come away experiencing as well because I believe when you read certain texts your consciousness expands exactly by simply allowing the words in and exactly. allowing that energy because everything has energy yes, as we all know. Agree. Mm -hmm. and so that <laughs> does help so I think the books that's why they exist um and go and get them Thank you, Betty. And I hope well, you come you. back at some point as well. I would love to. I would love to. Thank There's you. There's another book in there as well. Are you working on something? Yes. Uh, I, well, I'm working on a book with a man from Japan who's actually a French-Canadian, but he's lived in Japan for 30 years. His wife is Japanese, his daughter. And uh, we're working on something together. And I'm also working, uh, I've just about finished, uh, an article which may be a small book on uh, the loss of the blueprint for our full development of our full potential and the retrieving of it, which we are retrieving it today. So I think that's a, a very, very important piece. So I'm, I'm working on it, <laughs> trying to get it right, you know. And are yeah. you are you helping? I know through Forever Family, what's your your work with that organization? Well, uh, Kimberly, who's Kimberly Saavedra, who's head of the Comlock Center, and I have a, a group called Visionaries, and that's people who come from both both organizations, whoever wants to, uh, who has pe people who have had experiences, but they are not comfortable talking with just anybody about it, you know. So this is a group where they can talk about these experiences, explore them, share them with each other, and we have that once a month every. Uh, the second Saturday of every month. And then we also have a radio show the fourth Thursday of every month. And both of these are sponsored by Forever Family Foundation. And that's the one that Kim and Janet and I do together. And people can just call in and tell their experiences. And uh, so, uh, and then uh, we've done other things for them. I've spoken at some of their conferences earlier and uh, we've just done a lot of different kinds of individual things like that. But those are the two things that we consistently do. And, and we love for every family foundation it's done so much oh uh, yes it's done so much for so many people in terms of understanding grief and how to work through it they really have and i will put a link to forever family in the show notes as well so oh, that good. you guys can go and listen to the radio show um because that's fascinating as well there's one other foundation oh, that's yes. doing some really good work uh, that's the scientific and medical network in the UK, Scientific and Medical Network. And they uh, th that was formed by scientists a de few decades ago, scientists who had had mystical experiences. And they said, we can't continue to perform the same kind of science. We have to include the mystic. So they uh, have scientists and mystics, and they discuss all of these issues. And now that uh, since uh, COVID, they're online and you can join the organization. And it's amazing the people who exist who are doing all these incredible things. So that's a wonderful organization, Scientific and Medical Network. Wonderful. I will put a link as well okay. to them. Oh, good. In the good. UK. I'll put a link. Because the more we know, the more that's available, mm -hmm. the more people can get in touch and start their journeys. Absolutely, because we're not going to get any of this on the major media. No. <laughs> so we have to find those places, the podcasts, the organizations that are focusing on it. And I wanted to say, too, that the French film uh, maker, uh, Anthony Chin, is doing a film of Merchants of Light. So that will be coming out, too. That's another project. Oh. Yeah, he's, he's quite good. I'm very impressed with his work. Okay, well, thank you so much. I thank you. I so enjoyed meeting you and talking with you. Thank you for joining me today. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment and share the video on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow on your favorite social media platform. See you soon.